Hello everyone. Uh, we are back with our uh, next uh, with our next webinar on uh, product management learning series. Uh, today we're going to talk about product market fit, and uh, I am Vibhor Bansal from NASCOM. Uh, uh, sorry for delay for a couple of minutes. Uh, got, got some call that I could not avoid. Uh, anyways, today we're going to talk about product market fit. How uh, uh, what delves into the assessing the fitment of a product to uh, meet the market needs. And to talk about it today, we have uh, Jainan Kotri. He is the computer science engineer with 16 years of experience and an MBA from uh, IM Bangalore. He's uh, with SAP Labs India for last 13 years and uh, has worked upon multiple products like uh, SAP CRM, life lifecycle management, and Currently working, currently working as a senior product manager on a success factor learning uh, product series of SAP. Um, I will not take much of a time. Just uh, one uh, reminder to you: uh, you have been attending these webinars, and you know that uh, you need to fill up a feedback form at the end of the session. Uh, we will take all the Q and A uh, uh, after uh, Jananda's presentation. Uh, but in between, you can send us your uh, your uh, queries on chat. So over to you, Jananda. Uh, hope you like it. Uh, thank you, Vibhor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for uh, joining the session. Um, before uh, we begin, uh, just a quick disclaimer uh, about uh, this session being mainly for uh, educational purposes. Uh, so we have two disclaimers, uh, this being a uh, joint exercise between uh, NASCOM and SAP. So a disclaimer from SAP that uh, this uh, session is also not uh, exactly a commitment or uh, any recommendation from SAP. But uh, yeah, I think um, moving with uh, the general disclaimers, considering that uh, Vibor has already introduced uh, me. Thank you, Vibor. Uh, we'll quickly move on to uh, uh, the agenda. So uh, today we'll uh, talk about uh, the product market fit. Uh, I think it's a pre pre pretty popular term now um, where uh, it, it covers uh, various things. Uh, but I think uh, in this uh, short session, we'll talk about how do you assess the fitment? Uh, how do you build a product which uh, has a good uh, product market fit and uh, explore factors beyond uh, the typical function features uh, to make a successful product. Mainly, uh, I'll, I'll mainly focus on uh, how do we build uh, because I think that's that's what we uh, look for uh, in in such a session. So. Um, Moving further, uh, like uh, the main thing in, in case of a product market fit is looking at uh, the market itself, right? Um, so the market itself, when you talk about market, it's it's a it's a pretty vague term, right? Now we can look at uh, market from various viewpoints. Uh, it's a huge market. Uh, you have uh, uh, like B two B markets. It depends on. Uh, your uh, company size, how you define, which is the areas you want to focus. So when it comes to uh, uh, the product market, so you need to make uh, some kind of a choice where you want to focus, right? So uh, it, for any company, whether it's a startup or a large enterprise, uh, and maybe even a conglomerate, uh, the most important thing is uh, to choose your market where you want to uh, play in or where you want to establish yourself, launch your products and uh, benefit from. Right? So this becomes uh, an extremely important uh, exercise. Uh, so in, in our excitement of uh, uh, launching products or focusing on markets, we can't keep it uh, very broad. So uh, unless you have a sharp segmentation, uh, it uh, it becomes a very broad exercise where uh, you'll spread yourself too thin. Right? So uh, if you look at uh, the general market, uh, you kind of slowly start 
uh, narrowing down based on your uh, key competencies on your strengths and then choose uh, which are the areas you want to focus in uh, and then that helps you build the right products for that market right so the first step is to define your area of uh, uh, operations or the area where whether it is products that you're building or services that you're offering so that's uh, that's a key factor okay. uh, so just a quick recap uh, uh, on on this aspect so the uh, market itself can be a collection of uh, users or customers and then uh, the main aspect is how do these uh, people derive value from what you offer? Right? And uh, when it comes to the product itself, uh, or it, whether it is a product or a service, you need to see how are you fulfilling, uh, whether it is stated or unstated uh, needs and wants that a consumer has. Right? Whether you're in a consumer market or a B2B market, uh, this this aspect, uh, not everything is a stated need and that you definitely need to understand and uh, see how you can fulfill. Right? So every product, it will have its points of parity. Uh, unless you are the first to market, uh, you need to define, uh, where, uh, like if you're the first to market, you need to kind of make them, create the market. Uh, but otherwise, uh, assuming that you are in an existing market, you you will have to have points of parity for your product compared to competition. But uh, because somebody has to choose you, uh, you need to have that differentiation or the unique uh, selling proposition, which uh, helps you uh, create a brand and have a successful product. So uh, these are uh, fairly uh, general terms. Uh, now let's uh, let's look at uh, the product market fit itself. Right? So uh, this is uh, like uh, I think if if you if you just uh, look up, uh, you'll have various definitions of uh, uh, how you define a product market fit. Right? But essentially, you need to. Uh, kind of if I if I just look at it uh, at a high level, it's how do you have your product uh, meet the requirements of the customer, right? So it it has to be meeting exactly the need what uh, the consumer has, right? You can take various examples for uh, how do you uh, get this, uh, which we'll get to, uh, and then. Uh, when it, when it comes to the market fit, uh, you, it's a key aspect of uh, the success or failure of a product. Like, uh, and it's an ongoing uh, process, a continuous journey, right? So, uh, if if you look at uh, what are the factors, right? Uh, how do you identify the needs of your uh, customer? And uh, it 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 starts with uh, defining. Uh, the market focus, right? So you could look at uh, uh, any broad uh, market, uh, whether you take FMCG, uh, automotive, software uh, market, apps market. So in each of these, if you see, it's a it's a huge market, right? So if I take automotive as an example, so broadly uh, everything uh, from commercial vehicles to personal vehicles. Uh, from a two-wheeler, uh, which is used for commute to a luxury car, everything is classified as automobiles. But then you look at uh, the players, very few players actually have uh, products across all segments. And even if they do, they will have uh, some kind of sharp focus areas for each of their uh, units. So you could have a conglomerate like Tata Motors, which uh, uh, deals from uh, commercial vehicles to uh, uh, like luxury vehicles like uh, Jaguar and Land Rover under the same uh, brand uh, at a mother brand level, but then uh, you, you wouldn't see Jaguar and uh, uh, the Tata trucks you know, being sold under the same roof, right? And you'd have different, uh, uh, completely different units managing that. So. When, when it comes to uh, you determining uh, what are the needs, so you need to identify your customer first. 
right? And then uh, you need to start uh, looking at that. So uh, going towards uh, building the right product, right? So that's that's primarily what uh, uh, we can focus on today for this uh, session. So uh, there are distinctly three phases uh, that we can broadly look at. Uh, the first one being the discovery of uh, what are the uh, uh, needs of the market, um, to identify what is your market, break it down, identify your customer, understanding the needs of your customer, then designing uh, the right product for that, and then delivering it. Right? So uh, the key aspect uh, where I think uh, if you if you uh, look at it from a product management uh, perspective is understanding the needs right so this is perhaps i think uh, uh, the most important uh, aspect of uh, any uh, building any product right so uh, this requires uh, some kind of in depth research and uh, uh, something which is not really uh, seen as much as uh, the qualitative research, right? So you can say, okay, this is the market I'm going to look at. These are the competitors. This is my uh, key strengths. But then uh, what about uh, understanding your uh, end uh, customer, right? You need to have empathy with that end customer. So uh, we can talk about uh, 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 this particular aspect. So we have something called uh, design thinking as a term, which also is spoken about quite a bit. I'll uh, I'll talk about it in, in this context of um, how do you go about building the right product, uh, taking inspiration from uh, design thinking methodology. Right? So this, uh, why design thinking? Uh, that's... Uh, in in, in uh, uh, my opinion, that's one of the ways where you can quickly get to the right uh, product market fit. Right? So you you have your scope, uh, and then you do your 360 degree research, uh, have in depth conversation with uh, your end consumer, uh, build empathy. When when you talk about 360 degree research, uh, you need to think of all the different stakeholders in in this particular market area that you want to focus in. Right? So if if you look at, uh, say, like previously we took the example of uh, Tata Motors in an automotive scenario. So uh, you look at uh, uh, their different uh, market segments. So they uh, operate in passenger vehicles to sports cars, to utility vehicles. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at uh, each of these markets, they're quite distinct. Uh, so you have uh, a buyer, uh, end user. So if you look at commercial uh, vehicles, so uh, the buyer may be a fleet owner. The end consumer would be uh, the uh, the end user is actually the driver. Then you have stakeholders in terms of uh, uh, who are the dealers, who are the distributors, who provide service, and then uh, how do you actually uh, have this entire supply chain and uh, maintenance uh, operations. So you have a whole host of things. So you need to look at all of these aspects. When it comes to uh, assuming uh, most of you may be focused on, uh, say, uh, IT products. So it's a similar thing when it comes to IT products. Right? So uh, if you are in um, the enterprise uh, market space into a B2B space, so you have uh, uh, stakeholders like uh, the IT department, the end user, who is the typical employee of the organization. And then you have the LOB uh, or the line of business or the business owners of this particular uh, product that you're building. Say if you take uh, CRM, for example, then you have the sales and service teams. Uh, the heads of the sales and service teams are possibly going to make the buying decision about your product. The people who are going to maintain it, uh, who are going to influence it, uh, is the IT team. But ultimately, your end user is the sales guy or the service guy who is going to use your product, right? So uh, 
this is at a high level who are the primary stakeholders so you need to do research of all of these different stakeholders right so you you know what is the ability to pay what are the business drivers and then when it comes to end users you need to understand that unless they actually use your product your product goes nowhere right so you need to uh, do qualitative research sit with your end users understand how uh, they operate today uh, and then look at uh, what is it that you can do to make their lives better uh, what is it that they are going to like uh, they may not mention everything to you uh, they are possibly just going to tell a few things which is based on their current experience um, and then uh, you need to understand what are their unstated uh, needs right so uh, you ask somebody okay uh, what do you like about this uh, particular uh, uh, job or uh, what is it that takes uh, more time so you do a lot of uh, open ended uh, questions rather than asking okay i'm planning to build something like this or i have a product like this do you think it works doesn't work for you right so few people may give you elaborate answers but it's it's not going to help so unless you look at uh, the person's behavior and uh, assess what they are doing where are they having uh, friction and then how do you minimize that uh, so th these are uh, things which you need to do as part of uh, the discovery process and then you need to come back with your team and uh, assimilate and synthesize all of this uh, information before you go on uh, uh, designing your product through ideation prototyping uh, right uh, and then validating with whether your understanding was right right so we'll come back to this uh, in a while right? uh, so uh, when it when it comes to uh, design thinking it's it's a combination of desirability feasibility and uh, viability right so how do you get to uh, this uh, optimal solution so i talked about first starting with uh, desirability right so why why desirability is the first piece which as mentioning we need to start with is because unless you get the desirability right so you may have the most technically geeky solution uh, maybe you'll provide it at uh, ultra low cost uh, and make it viable but then unless it is desired by the end user it's it's not really uh, going anywhere right so you won't get the kind of adoption or traction in the market uh, which you looking for if you have the desirability right and you're building the solution towards that uh, i think the uh, most of us being uh, uh, say experts in 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 our uh, uh, respective companies whether it is startups or large enterprises we know what is feasible what is not feasible and uh, uh, also what is viable from a costing perspective but where most of the products falter is understanding the desirability um, so which is where design thinking uh, helps you understand uh, the desirability aspect and then quickly validate and then deliver faster to the market a right solution right so you get uh, something which is innovative but uh, you also get it fast so uh, we can talk about a few examples uh, of uh, design thinking so you could you could have uh, uh, roadblocks at each level right so uh, one of the things when it comes to uh, design thinking uh, in terms of discovery is empathy right uh, so if you if you take uh, a typical end user so they, they may they may tell you a lot of things right uh, they may rant about their work they may talk about their jobs what they like what they don't like and then uh, but what they say uh, may not be what they do right and what's really important is what they think and feel while they're uh, doing their particular roles or jobs or uh, using those particular products right uh, this is whether it is um, uh, a basic uh, uh, consumer app uh, 
a mobile app or uh, it could be your routine job right so uh, if you see uh, you have any uh, just uh, like we, i talked about consumer apps so if you look at uh, the mobile app store uh, go into any category and uh, you will have say a few hundred uh, apps which cater to each of the uh, particular needs right but there are very few which have huge adoption right and uh, many of them like uh, maybe uh, they they get pushed they have the brand backing and uh, initially they may get a lot of downloads but uh, the stickiness or whether they will actually uh, be used for the extended length of time depends on uh, how how uh, how good they are and how how much of a perfect fit it is right uh, so if you if you see any of our uh, popular uh, uh, categories whether it is apps uh, on uh, ios or android uh, you will see a lot of uh, churn in the leaders but there are few who manage to stay at the top by continually evolving and uh, adding uh, the right features so simplicity understanding what the person feels while they are using it Uh, makes the key difference right um, so if you if you talk about adoption in the market uh, this becomes uh, the most important thing how how much of a user research was done uh, before uh, launching this particular product and uh, whether it, it actually tried to do a lot of things or do the basic uh, address the basic need in the right way Right. Uh, so when it comes to uh, empathy, when I say what people say, what people do, think, and feel are quite different, that's because um, it's basic human nature that people will tell you what uh, you would like to hear many a times, right? Uh, but they may not uh, feel uh, el- elated when they're using it, right? So if you ask anybody, do you want something which is low cost? everybody uh, would possibly say yes i would i would prefer something which is a low cost solution but you look at uh, the market success the lowest cost product may not always be the most successful we have various examples of uh, uh, really good products uh, which are built uh, to a price but then uh, they falter somewhere uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the evolving landscape the cheapest uh, automobiles aren't always the most sold uh, india is a classic example where uh, some of the cheapest uh, automobiles actually uh, though they sell well in terms of market share uh, they are a small fraction but if you ask anybody in in a market research uh, survey they'll say yes i i i want something which is cheap but when they what they think is no i also want something which uh, uh, gives me a social status and what they feel when they use the product they need to feel good about it they need to feel some sense of luxury uh, when it comes to apps um, or pro- uh, software products or it products in general it's a similar thing right so uh, when it comes to hardware you uh, say mobile phones people look at it okay i want the lowest cost mobile i want the biggest screen uh, but then uh, you have things like okay i want it to be sturdy i want it to be rugged right it it has to fit in your hand uh, it has to have a good battery life and whole host of things but then what they don't uh, say is that i want it to actually uh, look like i'm owning a big brand uh i i need to have uh, a good uh, user experience uh in using it it shouldn't crash so these are things which you'll only realize when you see right uh the seamless background experience is how easily it syncs up the data uh you would see a, a shift in uh, market preferences uh, over a period of time from uh, the basic uh, phones to uh now you you no longer have uh, the cheap smartphones being the dominant ones but the mid range to the high end phones actually uh being being the number one uh, or number two 
uh, sold uh, products. When it comes to software products, again, it is very similar. The adoption of a product is actually based on uh, uh, how easy or how how well this particular app does its job, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, payment solutions, uh, we, we have uh, 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 credit cards, which are uh, good digital payment solutions. But uh, the reason why, uh, if you look at why personal wallets uh, took off, uh, you can see various reasons why uh, they take off, right? Uh, because Credit cards uh, possibly uh, ha have certain stigma in certain people. Then there's friction. People don't tell you that, okay, it, it actually is painful to use. Uh, vendors uh, also don't tell you that, okay, if you ask them, they'll say, you know, like for a hundred rupee transaction, if I need to swipe a card, uh, it takes uh, like three or four attempts for it to dial and then make payment. Uh, right? I, I lose time while doing that. So these are all uh, different things when uh, it comes to uh, this product uh, uh, preferences uh, of the end consumer. So moving to another example, uh, right, uh, I'm taking an example which is uh, in contrast uh, to what we typically think of as products. Uh, so th uh, this is more of a design thinking uh, challenge uh, which was Put out, and uh, we would all know of uh, how critical it is to give um, good care, uh, neonatal care, to uh, prematurely born babies. Right? Uh, so, how do you build uh, a good neonatal care uh, unit? Right? So, the typical neonatal care unit in uh, uh, the developed world uh, is is a very hi-fi equipment. Uh, state of the art can do almost anything uh, that is required uh, but is resource intensive so um, you have an alternate uh, which is a low cost uh, unit which is built for uh, developing markets but then uh, let's talk about uh, the kind of challenges right so um, if you look at uh, in developing countries um, you, you have uh, various challenges. So those challenges may be coming down, but then um, you, you still have uh, various remote areas where uh, it's very hard to reach, but what do you do, right? Um, so this challenge was put forth and uh, people took it up uh, in different teams. They saw, okay, these are the constraints. Uh, they identified the need and with all of these in mind, they came up with an innovative uh, warmer, which was built at say 1% uh, the cost of a traditional incubator. Right? Um, so this is uh, why I took this example is, you can see that uh, while each of us would want to build uh, the traditional incubator kind of product and make uh, a lot of money and be a large brand, uh, when it comes to uh, MVP for your product, uh, this 1% cost warmer is actually what you need to build first. This is the need, this addresses uh, the major need. And then you go on adding and whether you reach out to the mid market or the high end market, this is where uh, your MVP is. Right? Um, so in the interest of time uh, going further, uh, instead of, uh, so uh, I'm just trying to summarize uh, uh, the various aspects of building the right product. Uh, so you need to understand the desirability. You could use design thinking to get your requirements right. You need to have a price to a value, right? Uh, low cost is not always uh, the best approach. You need to see what are the different values uh, that you give to the end consumer. Right, so whether uh, it's an app where you see how many clicks a person has to do to uh, buy something, right? Uh, so if you, if you look at uh, user behavior, the lesser uh, the uh, decision load that you put on uh, the user, the better the adoption, 
right? Uh, so whether it is set up. So in case of apps, if you have uh, 10 steps to sign up and uh, start using the app, then uh, you already have lost half the consumers or more. Right? Uh, to use it, whether it's doing what it is supposed to do, uh, whether you got all the requirements right, uh, is, is crucial. So you need to get the MVP, you need to iterate. Uh, so to get to your MVP, you need to be frugal and you need to look at the market needs. And initially, when you're doing the MVP, don't look at revenues uh, alone. Get it right and then you'll definitely uh, scale up. Right. So uh, after you do the MVP, you need to have a scalable model for uh, increments and you need to quickly adapt as uh, the markets are continually changing. You need to innovate. You need to uh, pivot as is required. Right? Um, so this becomes a crucial part in uh, finding uh, the right uh, fit to the market. So uh, when it comes to uh, the product itself, right? So when you're building the MVP, the reason why you need to build the MVP, um, right? So when, when you initially are enthusiastic, uh, we typically have uh, the enthusiasm to say, okay, my product can do just about everything, uh, like a Swiss Army knife. Uh, but if you have 18 different functionalities, but is not purpose built for even one, then uh, possibly the consumer takes uh, a lot of time to understand, to learn how to do use your product. And then you possibly have already uh, uh, kind of made your uh, journey uphill from there. Versus uh, understanding one key need and addressing that. So let, let's, uh, let's take uh, some examples of uh, apps, right? So uh, we have certain payment solutions like Paytm, Free Charge, uh, to, to name among the top few. And if you see, uh, like each of them has a strong association. Uh, like if you look at Paytm today, it does uh, so many things, right? So uh, you could you could start off uh, by doing simple recharges of mobile phones to today buying any large product on this platform. But uh, before this feature overload was done, uh, the first basic thing was uh, to get uh, the basic payment. Uh, so you had a wallet, you can make payments easily. So the friction was reduced, adoption was increased, and then slowly features kept getting added, the ecosystem was built, and then uh, the rest of it is business decisions. I'll not go into analyzing uh, this particular product, but, uh, it, it, I hope it gives you a kind of idea of how you need to get your uh, focus right initially and then only go on doing a overload. Right? Um, so if, if you quickly look at uh, uh, the top apps that you have, right? you have messaging apps. Uh, you have a whole host of messaging apps today uh, from uh, the basic SMS, to uh, something which is quite popular uh, uh, in terms of usage like WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, uh, Hike Messenger, and uh, I don't know how many more uh, people are using. But uh, if you see the market adoption, uh, you'll realize that the people who actually started with the core value proposition and made it easy for people, they understood the market, this is the market for communication, and this is what I built. Uh, this is how I serve the need, low friction, single click, and make it easy to use, right? Um, uh, if, you, if you take uh, Uber or Ola um, for uh, commute purposes, right? Uh, you have many taxi services, but they changed uh, the whole market. They, they did pump in a lot of money, um, uh, to create incentive mechanisms, but if you just look at the apps alone, right, uh, they're they're brilliant in in simplicity. But they understood the market. They told, okay, I need to change behavior over the period of time. I have deep pockets, and I'm going to do it. Uh, but these are uh, not the perfect examples when it comes to uh, the typical uh, 
product in terms of an IT product uh, because uh, we always associate it with uh, so many other things. But uh, you could it's it's easier to understand how uh, uh, these things happen right? because we use these on a day to day basis. Right. Uh, so if you if you drill down on uh, any of these, you'll see how how these have changed uh, behaviors and how they understood their market. They got the right fit, um, and they essentially went uh, into great adoption. Right. So how do you uh, how do you scale from MVP uh, onwards? Right. So you need to uh, once you launch your product into the market. You need to assess and adapt continually by looking at market performance. How is the customer acceptance? Are your customers actually uh, continuing to promote it to other uh, customers? So this is where you would see, uh, like if you have high customer acceptance, high net promoter score, that means you have the perfect product market fit, right? Your adoption will start zooming up, uh, your, uh, Customers uh, will stay on your platform or your uh, product, and uh, they want more of your product, right? You don't need to uh, kind of go on selling it, but they they start doing the sale for you, right? So that's that's a perfect market fit. But if you have, uh, uh, say, declining uh, uh, adoption, so everybody installed your app, but uh, uh, they're not using it. Uh, they are uninstalling it. Uh, if your product is bought, but it is lying as shelfware, and uh, if your hardware is sold, but uh, nobody is using it, uh, right? So then, then you you automatically know that something is going wrong. I'm able to attract the people, but then I'm not able to make them stay on, right? So that's that should ring alarm bells, and then you start uh, going back in the cycle to see how do you go from here. So uh, what happens is uh, the initial adoption may happen uh, because of uh, increased expectations or uh, some kind of uh, uh, overselling that we do. So uh, that's that's uh, some of the don'ts that uh, we should look at. That maybe you try to. Um, do a lot at once and then people are confused they are not able to use so uh, take a step by step approach focus on the core get the fit right and then uh, scale up from there and uh, it's not about feature functions uh, right so if you have 100 features it's it's not going to always result in great customer satisfaction uh, like you can take various examples where a simple product with uh, basic functionality trumps uh, uh, a very feature-rich product, right? Um, so you could take hardware examples uh, and uh, you could take software examples, both of which uh, uh, you can see where uh, extremely feature-rich product actually didn't result in uh, uh, the best uh, adoption in the market, right? Uh, and many a times it is overselling, which actually creates dissonance with customers. They buy a dream and then they realize, oh, it's not actually fulfilled, right? Um, so that's that's something uh, to also be conscious of. So uh, just to look at. Uh, uh, I think uh, the gap between feature functions and uh, uh, what is the MVP, uh, that, that should actually tell you, okay, uh, if I'm doing 90% right, so in case of, uh, say, the payment solution, if I have a wallet which will allow me to pay in single click, that's what the customer wants, and not that, okay, I can configure 100 things on payments and then uh, do a lot of things. Uh, so we are almost at uh, uh, about 40 minutes into the session. So I'll uh, quickly summarize and then we can look at questions. So um, we looked at uh, how do you discover and uh, focus on the core value proposition using design thinking. 
the next step would be to uh, when you build the product look at uh, uh, reducing friction for the consumer keep low decision load uh, one click is a uh, is a way of telling that okay keep it extremely simple to use uh, whether it is a software product or any other product and, uh, keep features to address the right needs as the dominant flow you can go on adding more complex things later and that's the path to sustained growth uh, by building testing and scaling right um, so i i think uh, uh, this is where i would like to take some questions um uh, uh, i'm not sure if um, people have already posted any questions uh, uh could you help uh, yeah, look up uh janendra for you uh, so yeah. i'll start it off here first of all thank you very much uh, comprehensively uh, summarizing uh, uh, the product market fit concepts uh, uh i have many questions for you uh, i'm trying to figure out which go first uh, there are um, but there's a one basic question that i see uh, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i would leave it to you whether you would like to take it up here or uh, maybe later uh, uh yeah this is uh, uh, what other methods and mechanism other than design thinking one can adopt for product design uh, mm -hmm. i believe this is more like a product design uh, 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 valenjain because valenjain is the one who is valenjain fernandez who is the one who is uh, asking this question so uh, mm -hmm. valenjain i think this question is more related to uh, design if you're looking at it from a design perspective then uh, this may not be a right forum but yes design thinking for me is an approach to do something and i leave it to jananda to you know uh, uh, address this uh, or if you could jananda uh, can share what are other approaches or mechanism sure so uh, when i say design thinking it's a broad uh, uh, categorization of the approach towards uh, uh, designing or uh, understanding your needs and uh, it's a path how you can quickly innovate and uh, design the right products but uh, the key aspect so even if you don't call it design thinking is you need to understand your customer and your uh, uh, market right so that's that's a key takeaway uh, uh, so if you can understand uh, the market then you can develop the right product for it right so understanding the problem which you are trying to address what is it that your product has to do and then when it comes to uh, you you may follow different frameworks different methodologies but this is the key thing i would say uh, to get the right fit into the market I, uh, okay. I think uh, uh, we can. Uh, I hope this uh, high-level explanation is uh, adequate, and then we can look at other questions. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, uh, so, uh, so to respond to the Valenjain, I think uh, you put it rightly. Design thinking is an approach where you are trying to understand the need of the customer, and then you know take it to the next level. Anyways, we have so many questions from Ria and uh, others. She has, I think. She has many doubts and many clarifications that she seeks. Uh, first of all, she asks, in case of industry agnostic products, should we always mm -hmm. start with a specific industry as a choice of market where products should be launched? Yeah. Um, so uh, for this, right, so this, uh, when we are uh, having a generic product, uh, the more important thing uh, than looking at a particular industry is looking at who are your uh, lead uh, customers right so a good representative customer regardless of industry is crucial if you're building something which uh, uh, you think fits very well in a particular industry or is going to be the dominant uh, uh, market for you uh, in terms of revenues uh, because you need to sustain uh, you could you could target that uh, collaborate with a few initial customers, uh, potential customers, and then build it for them, and then uh, you could go. So uh, uh, focus on a particular industry is not always required, but that is a good way to start. Okay. Uh, but you need to be conscious that you don't get into a industry solution before you uh, build your product, right? So. 
that's that's fine if uh, that's going to be say your major market uh, but uh, if you're thinking purely from a product perspective you need to have some generic aspect and then look at uh, having the industry flavor to it hmm. uh, i hope this answers her query uh, she has many more questions but i'll take on uh, as and when that the relevant segments comes in because many people have a similar questions uh, one mm -hmm. question that uh, i would like to take up now from farhad ali sayed and he s says a uh, product uh, fit for a software product uh, isn't it different uh, ball game altogether when it compared to an automobile automobiles at the at the time of purchase we do not talk about customization specific needs or uh, must haves but in software product this is always a challenge hence what is a specific approach to a better product fit for a software product yeah uh, so uh, when i took the automobile example uh, so from a product perspective it is very similar so uh, when we look at uh, productized services or uh, enterprise buyers that's when uh, i think uh, his dilemma is that most of the time when you're doing enterprise sales uh, your customer is actually having complex needs and uh, uh, the fit over there actually you're doing a custom fit for each uh, customer right so you have a generic product and then uh, that that is the base for you upon which you are going to customize and offer solutions to to this particular customer whom you are trying to do a sale uh, but then uh, i think from a product perspective you definitely need to have a strong base product which caters to majority of the needs and uh, the rest of the final customization is is to be treated separately so your product has to enable that to happen uh, it's just like uh, uh, telling that okay i i buy a package solution but i need to fit it to my own needs so if you if i take another analogy so uh, you go to uh, a ready made uh, uh, garment store uh, say you are bu buying a shirt or the pant and then you are going to alter the length right so your customizations in your product has to be like that right and not that i uh, stitch each time for this particular customer right so then that is more the service that you are offering uh rather than a product um okay uh, now ravin has a, a very interesting question when he says uh, how do you win back users who installed your product but have stopped using it okay uh, on the uh -huh. similar uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, i have a, another uh, a question i don't know whether they are, i find it little related so i am putting these two together uh, Shantanu mm -hmm. asked that uh, uh, how to decide uh, the product has become unfit for the market, especially in the technical commodity market. Uh, is it direct indication like drop in sales, uh, oblique market share, or indirect indication like conventional PLCs of the product? Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, I, I would say they are uh, somewhat related. So the moment you have decline in adoption, right uh, decline in sales is uh, is is another indicator but decline in adoption itself is a great indicator for you to understand that you are you're not having the perfect fit right so uh, though they are uh, i think i'll take the second one first telling that okay uh, you can look at various indicators the customer satisfaction people uh, complaining a lot uh, people complaining uh, about uh, missing features is a good thing but telling it's not working uh, or uh, being irate uh, that's another so you need to analyze what are the kind of uh, support calls you're getting uh, what is the level of adoption if you have such metrics and uh, the decline in sales right so then you need to assess what is it what is the reason are you being uh, uh, phased out is the market at all relevant market is shrinking or your competitors are taking a going ahead or something wrong with your product right so uh, to look at the second question uh, the first question about uh, how do i get my customers to come back uh, that that depends on so there's no generic uh, uh, 
answer to that right so you need to have a way of reconnecting to your uh, customers whether it is uh, enterprise or consumers and then uh, once you know why people have actually stopped using right uh, i think that's uh, that's a important thing so if your customers were using just because you offered uh, something low cost or you gave some freebies they possibly not going to come back unless you give that back right in terms of freebies so the stickiness has to be because of the value proposition and if you find that uh, the value proposition has changed you need to adapt to the new value proposition and then go back to them and say okay uh, i heard uh, i value your uh, association uh, we see that uh, your uh, your adoption has come down we are not using as much uh, one way is to uh, actually ask them why they are not using uh, a few of them at least might respond and then you can go back and tell okay we heard uh, you and uh, that actually builds loyalty to tell that okay once you solve a customer's problem or you know that you are heard then it builds a bonding and then possibly adoption might go up okay uh, uh, yeah yeah so uh, the value proposition is the key in both the, uh, yes. in both cases uh, yes. now uh, on empathy uh, uh, we have a uh, i'm coming back to uh, ria's question which says if say is not equal to do or uh, is not equal to think and is not equal to feel what yeah. should be the basis of priorities of features to be introduced uh, what they say oblig do uh, or what we think and feel should also be there to give the users the happiness question it feels like uh, more of a comment uh, than question yeah uh... yeah i think uh, it's uh, I, i would still like to say that uh, uh, you need to look at what people think and feel a lot more than what they say what they do is definitely very important uh, it's not to ignore what they say but uh, you need to probe a little bit uh, deeper when you do qualitative research open ended discussions you'll you'll understand that uh, uh deeper insights into why people behave in a certain way right so uh just to uh, give some kind of analogy uh it's like people tell okay i'll always buy the cheapest product but they actually go and buy something else something which is a lot more expensive right and uh, that 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 should uh, tell a lot of people uh why uh there's a dissonance between what they say and uh what they do right so you may tell okay i i would definitely want this feature uh but they're possibly not using that but they're using a different feature right so that uh, analytics uh so when you sit with a end user you you possibly get some of those insights okay uh an in interest of time i'll take only uh, one last question uh mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh sachin has uh, some question uh this says for a good product which si- life cycle model is best suited in it organizations agile waterfall or iterative uh i would say uh agile and iterative uh, help uh, especially when you are uh, looking at uh, uh, smaller products with short cycles um where you, your product needs to continually evolve uh so if you look at most of uh, the presentation it was talking about uh, an iterative approach uh, right uh, but waterfall still has its place for uh, many things right uh, though I, i don't say that you shouldn't iterate but uh, i wouldn't discount waterfall completely right especially for the larger products uh yeah uh, so as i said in interest of time we uh, cannot go beyond maybe we'll share these questions with jananda and he can respond over emails to these uh that will find the opportunities or uh, possibilities and we'll get back to you guys uh, meanwhile uh, and uh, now uh, thank you jananda thanks for uh, thanks conducting the sessions and thank you everyone for uh, for joining us we will see you next time uh, in the next session 
on 3rd May, uh, which will be talking about the product culture of building product organizations. Uh, it's some sort of a leadership talk uh, 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 that we will, uh, you know, circulate the details very soon. Uh, please do not uh, forget to uh, fill up your uh, feedback uh, form uh, as soon as the session ends. Uh, we will, uh, you will see a couple of questions which will not take more than 30 seconds of your time. Thank you, Janana. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Vibhav. Thank you, everyone.